computer. Okay, welcome back. I am not fully recovered from COVID. As I said in my email yesterday, I went three and a half years without getting it, and I wore a mask into a restaurant. I wore a mask out of the restaurant, but that's the only time I left the house, so I think that's where I got it, or that's where my wife got it and gave it to me because my symptoms showed up a day later. But anyway, uh, according to CDC, I had to stay home today, but I will be on campus tomorrow through Friday. So tomorrow through Friday will be live, except for Paige, and then we can uh, take our exam on Friday live in person. Okay, I will be wearing a mask the entire week, but after that, I will just wear a mask into the, uh, into the uh, um, lecture hall, and then I will lecture without a mask, but I will lecture with a mask on for this week for your safety. Okay. Uh, as far as how it went, I, you know, I think it was kind of obvious during the videos that that was not my uh, finest hour, but I was able to at least get some of the information across, even though we got a little behind, but we will catch up this week with chapters five, six, and seven to be ready for our exam on Friday on five, six, and seven. It's a great place to actually do six and seven just together because there's a lot of mechanism stuff and that's new stuff for us. And we're going to learn that today. Okay, uh, so for me, uh, you might actually see me break into a cold sweat. That's the only symptom I have right now is I randomly break into cold sweat, so I'll get all glossy. And so if you see that, that's not that I'm nervous. It's that it's, it happens about every two or three hours. I don't know why, uh, but they said that that's a symptom and it could go on for another week. So hopefully that will um, uh, go away sooner than that. All right. That being said, welcome back. I hope none of you get it. It is not fun. All right. So let's continue on with chapter five. Okay. Chapter five was about stereochemistry. Remember, stereo means space. And we had two kinds, a geometric isomer, which is the cis and trans. And then we had the stereo isomer, which is only uh, our optical isomer. when the only way we can tell them a difference is some using light. Okay, and I'm gonna explain that today. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna turn off blur because it looks like I'm glitching a little bit. And there we go, that's a little bit better. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, uh, share screen. Oh, actually first, while we're here, let me go ahead and uh, describe how it's going to, um, how you're gonna do the uh, makeup quiz. I mean, sorry, how to do the test corrections. Come on, share. Hmm. All right, so you should be able to see this is our front page for our for our uh, uh, screen. What we're going to do is we're going to go to quizzes, and you've already done this one. If you can see the answers, I can't tell if you can see the answers. You you can just go and look at the answers and transpose them over. But I want you to go ahead and do the corrections. There's no proctorio. There's no time limit. I want you to complete the second exam correction, quit, uh, complete all of those questions, and then it'll spit out a number for me and I'll take half of the points you got and add it to your exam too. I am going through exam one right now. I should have those posted by the end of the day. Uh, exam two won't be posted till the end of tomorrow, but I think that's going to help us uh, see where we are. I should also be caught up on grading homework and the activities uh, by Friday so that you should, by the end of by uh, Monday, you should have a really good idea where we're sitting, okay? Uh, the first exam was pretty good. The second exam wasn't as good, but we're moving along pretty quick. And so let's keep going and keep trying. And I, I know we can just uh, make it through this semester, okay? Questions or comments about the corrections? Okay, then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go ahead and share my other screen, which is my iPad here. And it should pop up, there we go. Uh, did you say we were able to see our answers? I cannot see your answers on there. And I, if you can go and look at it, I, I actually said you, sh I, I posted that you could see your, your results. I don't know if that means you can see your answers. So if you can check, uh, it doesn't open till 1140 after class. But uh, if someone would email me and say they can or cannot, uh, I don't really like doing it this way, but it's the only option I had. And so uh, I couldn't like download your answers and email them to you because that's test integrity. So I couldn't, but if you can see them because you, uh, I've opened it to you to see them, that would be fine. If not, just go ahead and do all the questions using your notes 
and hopefully you'll get more, more right than you did without notes, okay? All right. Uh, so again, if you have any questions, go ahead and email me. I will, I'm hoping to be working most of the day. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so let's go back to optical isomers. Optical isomers are defined as R and S. They are exactly the same empirical formula. They have all the same connections. The only thing different is two groups are swapped in space, and that makes them non-superimposable mirror images of themselves. And we had an R and an S. Remember, the R is clockwise, and the S is counterclockwise. And I, that's from my perspective, counterclockwise and clockwise. So uh, I think most people actually got that right on the quiz when I was, I mean, on the uh, exam when I was looking at that. So we're going to move on and go to a slight complication, OK? When we have one stereo center, you either have a stereoisomer or you don't, okay? Because when you have one stereo center and you have four different things and you can make a non-superimposable mirror image, then you have isomers. If they do not meet those demands, they are not stereoisomers. However, when you get to more than one symmetric center, we have to go back to remembering mirror planes. Mirror planes are gonna give us a little bit of trouble when we have stereoisomers with more than two stereo centers. Okay, now the first thing we need to know about how many different isomers we would have is for every stereo center you have, it's gonna be two to the N, N is the number of stereo centers. So if you have one stereo center, that's N is one. And so two to the one is two. So you're only gonna have two stereo isomers. Okay, up to two stereo isomers. Okay, that's very important because we're gonna be looking at mirror planes again. When we have two stereo centers, that N is two, so two to the two, so it's two times two is four. And if we had three stereo centers, that's two times two times two, which is eight, okay? So see how many isomers we keep getting as we go higher and higher and higher? So it gets really complicated. And so we're gonna learn a new way to view these things. We've already learned about our stereo projections with the wedges and stuff like that. We learned about our Newman projections so we can see the physical rotation. We're gonna learn another projection that helps us look at stereo centers, okay? So let's think about our system here. If we have stereo isomers, if we have one stereo center, we have enantiomers, okay? Enantiomers always come in pairs, okay? So we have enantiomers, and that's one stereo center, okay? If we have more than one stereo center, then we have diastereomers, di meaning two or more, stereo centers, dia meaning two or more. So we have more than two or more stereo centers, okay? Which means we have a lot more isomers. The two isomers that are non uh, superimposable mirror images of each other are enantiomers. But to get the other isomer, those isomers are not gonna be mirror images of the first two enantiomers. They are only gonna be mirror images of themselves, okay? So this pair is a pair of enantiomers. This pair is a pair of enantiomers. The Bach of four is a set of diastereomers. Now, the cool thing is that when you have this set of, of enantiomers, they have the exact same physical properties. This set of enantiomers has the same set of physical properties, but these two sets have different physical properties than each other, okay? So we can see the difference between the two different sets. Okay, so what does this look like? So let's add one more stereo center than we had before, and let's do it with this structure here. And there's my pencil. And we're gonna, again, look, the, number one, is it a stereo center? We have one, two, three, four different things. We have one, two, three, four different things. So yes, we have stereo centers and we have two of them and they're right next to each other. Okay. Because we have those two stereo centers, N is two, which means we have up to four isomers. Okay. Now I say up to four because of identifying our different sets here. So let's look at this one right here and let's draw our mirror plane here. So this OH is mirroring that, this is mirroring that, this is mirroring that. So notice the bond types right here. So those are wedges, these are solid wedges, and these are lines, and all the mirrors are the same. And then again, a, a regular bond line mirroring this, a, a wedged bond line mirroring that, and a solid a wedge mirroring this. So do we see that those are mirror images of each other? Okay, so that means this set here 
is our first set of enantiomers. Enantiomer, okay? And now, so this is our first set. So I'm gonna just draw a box around this set. Come on. Okay, so these are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. Now, if we take one of those stereo centers and flip it, okay, that's all we have to do is take one of these stereo centers. And in this case, what we did was we moved the chlorine to the front and the hydrogen to the back. Notice that that's the only thing we did here. This is in exactly the same position, okay? So uh, actually it's gonna be this one. Yeah, sorry. We moved this chlorine here and this hydrogen here and notice all of these are in exactly the same position. So this is almost, let me actually change colors here. So this side is the same as this side here, but this side has this chlorine and the hydrogen swap. That's the only difference. Now, because of that, they are no longer mirror images of each other, and they are now not enantiomers, but they are diastereomers. Okay, so let's look at that again. So we have our compound that's not the same as the other compound, but now let's draw our mirror plane here and notice this mirror's here, this mirror's here, mirror here. The chlorines are both out, the hydrogens are both back, and the methyl groups are both up. Do we see that those are mirror images of each other? Okay, say yes. All right, all right. Now, what I wanna say now is that this, because they're mirror images of each other, is our second set of an antiomers, okay? So we have one set of enantiomers, enantiomers always come in pairs, write that down one set of enantiomers, but the set of all four of these are diastereomers. So um, <clears throat> this is the diastereomer of this and this. This is the diastereomer of this and this. These are, these right here, are the diastereomers of each of these, but within that group, you have two enantiomers, two enantiomers, a pair of enantiomers making up four diastereomers. Okay, questions, comments, concerns about that, okay. Now, in this case here, all of these are identified, okay. So there's an easy way to look for this, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our mirror planes to help looking for them, okay. So in here, we're going to, again, draw our mirror plane, and we're going to switch colors to, uh, let's do blue again. So we're gonna draw our mirror plane and notice that they are perfect mirror images of each other, which by definition makes them enantiomers. And then if we look at this side here, perfect mirror images of each other, and therefore they are enantiomers, okay? Now that makes these diastereomers of these and these diastereomers of these. Okay, do we see how they are different because of the first requirement for being enantiomers, which is non-superimposable mirror image? Okay, so it's best to draw these out and look at our mirror planes, okay? So how do we do our nomenclature for this? We have two different compounds that we have to enable our R and our S2, okay? So we didn't kind of get to that, but I wanna to get to the idea that we can actually, whenever we do our nomenclature, you again, start with your functional group, your longest chain, your substituents. And then as it gets more and more specific, you put those things at the front of the molecule. So here we have to identify, we can't just say that this is S uh, butane diol or butane S butanol or R butanol because we have two different centers. So we have to identify those centers with numbers, just like we identify functional groups, I'm sorry, substituents with numbers. So in the case here, we have just the uh, three bromo two butanol, but we have two chiral centers. So that's not specific enough. That could be four different compounds, right? Two enantiomers, two enantiomers, and a set of diastereomers. So we have to identify this exact molecule by assigning the R and the S and then locating them on our, our uh, group here. 
So let's go through our nomenclature review here. We have butanol, which means we have four carbons and the OH must be on that longest chain and it must have the lower number. So we have two as our butanol. So that means this is our two carbon, our one carbon, our three carbon and our four carbon, okay? So we have two butanol, okay? And then we have a bromine on the third carbon right here. So that's where the three comes from. Okay, so now let's assign R and S, okay? So if we look here, let's look, uh, let's do the number two carbon first. If we look here, our hydrogen is facing back, okay? So that's great. So that means we have an easy way to identify our one, two, and three. So I'm gonna go ahead and identify those uh, with a different color here. So our O is gonna be one because it has the highest Z number. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, um, rule number one. Our carbon here is gonna be number two because it is the same as the other carbon, but it has another carbon and a bromine attached to it. So it has higher Z numbers attached, so it's number two. Then the three hydrogens are gonna make it number three, and then our hydrogen's number four. Hydrogen's almost always number four. So now they're away from us. So we're looking at a one, two, three, and by my perspective, that's counterclockwise, which means it is R or S. Counterclockwise, sinister, which is S. So we've identified this one as S. Perfect, great. Yeah, keep your chats open. All right, so now let's do the other thing to, that, so that means that our carbon number two has the S configuration. So let's go ahead and do carbon number three. All right, we have our hydrogen facing us. So, ooh, that's gonna be harder. Uh, Bromine is gonna be one. The carbon with a carbon and a hydrogen is gonna be two. So that's one, that's two, that's three. And I'm gonna use my hand trick because if we look at that right here, I'm gonna put my hydrogen where my wrist is. The bromine is going to be this finger. The carbon with the OH is going to be this finger. And then the CH3 is going to be that finger. So we have one, two, three, but we have to have it in our correct perspective. So I have to do one, two, three, which for me is clockwise. Okay. Because it's clockwise, that's going to make it the R configuration. Okay. Now, there is a trick some of you are going to use. Okay. You're going to look at this and say, well, okay. It's one, two, three, it's clockwise. I mean, it's counterclockwise and it's reversed. So I just need to flip it backwards. If you keep track of that, it's okay to use that trick. So what I'm saying here is that it is currently clockwise. I mean, counterclockwise, but because the H is facing toward you, if by perspective wise, if you turn it around, it will be clockwise. Okay, use one of those two tricks, either the hand or the reverse thing, just keep track of which one you do. All right. So that's going to bring us to our number three carbon is assigned R. Okay, so now let's hook this all together. We already have our three dash bromo dash two dash butanol. Okay, so now we have to say that the two, the S is on the two carbon. So we put a bracket out in front saying it's identifying something in the molecule. Okay. Uh, notice it's a parenthesis, not a bracket like we use with uh, bicyclos. It's, see, nomenclature is very specific. It helps us tell a lot of things. This is 2S comma 3R. And if you had more stereo centers, you just put a comma 5 whatever, comma 7 whatever, comma whatever, and you just keep building that out until you close your brackets. And then you have the rest of the IUPAC name as such dash three dash bromo dash two dash butanol. Okay, do we see how to label multiple stereo centers? Okay, if you only have one, you just have to put R S at the beginning with a dash. If you have two, you have to assign which carbons they're on and their assignment. If you have more than that, just keep going. So it's just adding a rule to our nomenclature. And if you'll notice on the nomenclature review on Canvas, this is one of the next rules down as soon as you start doing stereochemistry, okay? All right, now I said you can have up to four stereoisomers if you have a, I'm sorry, up to four diastereomers, okay? But they had to completely follow all the rules for the uh, being stereoisomers. Now, on occasion, you can find a mere plane in the middle of a compound with two chiral centers. 
Okay, so let's look at this. This right here, carbon, has a chiral center, right? It's had a hydrogen, a bromine, a, a carbon, and a carbon that's different. This has the exact same thing on this side. So those are two chiral centers. But there's only one isomer. And I didn't call it a stereoisomer. There's only one isomer because if we draw a plane here, the methyl groups match, the bromines go along the back, the hydrogens go along the front. So that means that it cannot, you cannot draw a mirror image of itself that's not superimposable. It will be superimposable because it has that mirror in the middle. Okay. Now that means it's no longer a, it will not have a, um, an antimer. Okay. It cannot, you would have superimposable. You just have a compound with two chiral centers in it. We call that a meso compound a meso compound. So you need to, once you draw your isomers, and then you're going to look for these mirror planes, okay? Now, there's a way to do this, okay? And you have to look for it in a bunch of different ways. So for example, you'd say, oh, that, do that doesn't look like it's uh, superimposable because look, the OHs are front and back, you know, so that's not right. But if you redraw this, such that you have the two sides of the molecule are like each other. So CH3, CH3. So I'm going to keep this side the same and I'm going to rotate this side 180 degrees. Okay. So that's so the methyl groups line up so you can look for the mirror plane. Okay. So we're going to look for that mirror plane. So when we do that, those two CH3s are up and notice that those two bond lines are also the same. So we're looking for a mirror plane. The hydrogen stays back because we don't move this side. The OH stays forward because we don't move this side, but the OH is gonna end up coming forward and the hydrogen is gonna end up going back. So we're gonna have an OH on our solid wedge here and then our dashed OH on the wedge here. Oh, sorry, that's a hydrogen. Our dashed hydrogen in the back, okay? Now, we've all we've done is rotated one of them by 180 degrees to get to this eclipsed formation. And now if we draw our mirror plane here, this side matches, this is in the back, this is in the front. That means this stereoisomer does not have a non-superimposable mirror image and therefore it's a meso compound, okay? So if we did that same kind of thing with this and we redrew these, uh, let's uh, change color. Okay, if I redraw this right here to do that exact same thing with the CH3s, and again, we're only rotating this side, CH3, uh, the hydrogen is going to stay back, the OH is going to go forward, and let's see, that means the OH is going to go back because it was forward, and the hydrogen is going to come forward because it was back, because all we're doing is rotating 180 degrees, Right there. And now if we draw our mirror plane, we have an OH and a hydrogen. That's not mirror image. We have a hydrogen and an OH. That's not a mirror image. All the methyl groups are. So that means it is, it does have a non-superimposable mirror image, meaning it does have an enantiomer. So in this case here, instead of having uh, a total of four diastereum, uh, four compounds, we only have three. So we only have three diastereomers. And whenever we have that, the one that doesn't have the, uh, that has the mirror plane is the meso compound, okay? Now we can also find this cutting through bonds or rings as well. For example, in the case of the, the cis dibromo compound, remember cis means both bromines are on the same side of the ring here. We want to have our line drawn there. The bromines in the front, the hydrogens in the back, all the carbons line up and therefore, it's a meso compound. It has that mirror plane. But if we tried to do this right here, we don't have a mirror plane. And if we rotated this around 180 degrees, the bromine would be back over here. The other bromine would be forward over here. And therefore, they are not superimposable. And therefore, they are a pair of enantiomers. And the set of all three is the set of diastereomers. Questions on that? So we're gonna look for some more mirror planes to make sure we get that right here. So these are definitions you will need to know, okay? And you should already know an antimer. An antimer is one or more stereo centers that have non-superimposable mirror images, okay? 
So in the case of this, we have this set of enantiomers and we might have another set of enantiomers. We don't know. Okay, so in the case of two or more, we call them diastereomers. And we still have to have pairs of enantiomers, but we have to look at each pair of enantiomer uh, to see if there's a mere plane. If there is a mere plane, there is a meso compound, and it drops down to four or sometimes seven, or sometimes it can even drop down to six different isomers, depending on how many things have mirror planes and how many stereocenters you have. Okay, so let's look at a bunch of different ways to look at mirror planes. So we're going to actually teach you this projection today. It really helps with mirror images, and it really helps us convert diastereomers and enantiomers. The other way to do it is with the wedge drawings, okay? Then again, this is a projection that makes it really easy. And don't forget rings. Rings have a top and a bottom. So that when we draw that mirror plane through here, the hydrogens are on the top, the OHs are on the bottom. So we need to look for that symmetry with the, between the top and the bottom of the rings. Okay, so that being said, let's do a little more with the cyclics because they can be troublesome, okay? So if we look at this, we have the cis, meaning these are on the same side, 1-bromo-3-methyl-cyclobutane, okay? It has no asymmetric centers. It has no chiral centers. Okay, why? Well, we got one different thing here, one different thing here. These two carbons are the same, and by the get to, time they get to here, those, those, that carbon's the same no matter which way you go around the ring. So that means these are, those do not, they do not have stereocenters. They have identical groups on two of the groups, and therefore they don't have any stereocenters. Okay, so, but we have uh, ability to have them on opposite sides of the ring. So we have one on the top, one on the bottom. Okay, so we don't have chiral compounds, but we do have stereoisomers. So it's still a stereoisomer because it has the cis and the trans, okay? but we don't have chiral centers, okay? So that's important in rings. You gotta look at them twice because they can be confusing. So let's look at this other one here. Uh, this is the cis-bromo-2-methyl-cyclopentane. And if we draw a line here, this is the mirror image of this. Hydrogen back, bromine forward, bromine forward, hydrogen back. And so that means that they have non-superimposable mirror images. That means that they have at least one pair of enantiomers, okay? So the cis right here has one chiral center here, one chiral center here. So this mirror image of each other is at least one pair of enantiomers, okay? Okay, let's look at the transversion. Remember, this is both coming at us, so they're on the same side. These are going one forward, one back, one back, one forward. And again, these are mirror images of each other. And if we rotated that around, the bromine would go to the back, the methyl group would come to the front. So um, th this methyl group would come to the front, this bromine would rotate to the back, and so we have a non-superimposable mirror, non mirror image, which means that these are also a pair of enantiomers, okay? All right, so because we have two stereocenters here, we have a enantiomers, uh, two pairs of enantiomers, and four diastereomers. But we also have stereo centers as well. We also have the cis and trans stereo centers. So there's a lot of stereochemistry just being here, okay? So when we actually try to identify just this one molecule here, right here, we're gonna have to do a whole bunch of work by saying, okay, this is our one carbon, this is our two carbon. So it's gonna be one, uh, and that is gonna be one, two, three, I'm going to assign this as S because it's going that way. 1S, comma, 2. This is going to be 1, 2, 3. So that's uh, clockwise, but we're going the other way. So that's S also. Bracket, bracket, dash, trans. So we have to put, to truly identify just this isomer. Come on. I'm going to figure out how hard to tap. To I generate this isomer, we're going to have to say that it's 1s, 2s, dash, trans, dash, 1-bromo, 2-methyl, cyclopentane. And we'd have to do that for all the other isomers, too, to identify all of them individually. 
All right, questions on rings. Okay, so we have two types of stereochemistry in rings. We can have cis trans isomerization and asymmetric or chiral centers. Okay, so, but again, rings, because rings can have uh, uh, similarities, we want to make sure we're looking for planes of symmetry. So for example, if we have one group on the one position and one group on the four position, and they're pointing in up, both up, we now have a plane of symmetry. We can draw it right between those methyl groups, and that turns it into a non-chiral compound, okay? Because neither side has four different groups, only three different groups. And if we look at the other isomer, this is the trans isomer, Notice one of the methyl groups is down, one of them is up. We can draw the mirror plane in that exact same place, meaning that this isn't chiral either. So neither one of these isomers is chiral, okay? But if we draw a line here, we'll see that, uh, that both of these groups are mirrored up and the ring is mirrored. So it's also not chiral because the methyl groups will mirror each other. But you can't draw that same plane here because we have a methyl group up and a methyl group down. So that means this does not have a mirror plane, and therefore this trans isomer has chirality, and it has two chiral centers, and we have to identify both chiral centers. Oh, that also means that we would have a set of diastereomers too. So that's chiral. We'd have to draw four compounds for that because there's no plane of symmetry. All right, so let's condense this down into a, into a kind of a, a, a workflow. We have two non-identical formulas, two non-identical molecules, okay? Uh, do they have the same molecular formula? If they have the same molecular formula, then they could be isomers. Then they are isomers, sorry. They are isomers. If they don't have the same molecular formula, then they're not isomers because they're different formulas, okay? So if these isomers have uh, the same name except for a prefix such as cis, trans, R, or S, or any combination thereof, then they are stereoisomers. Remember, cis and trans are stereoisomers. R and S are stereoisomers. If not, that means that if they have different names, one says uh, hydroxy and one says uh, uh, something else, uh, then they are constitutional isomers. They are just the same atoms hooked together in a different way. All right. Now, do these isomers have mirror images of each other? Okay. And if they do, they are enantiomers. And if not, they're diastereomers or stereoisomers, like the cis and the trans. All right. So this is just kind of a, a workflow to kind of, as you're looking at molecules, you want to work through these questions, ask yourself these questions. And if you get down to the part with enantiomers, you have two compounds. And if you have diastereomers, you have at least. Uh, two to the n, uh, sorry, you have up to two to the n isomers. Okay, uh, 1033. All right, so now I want to show you a projection that makes it very easy to do both single um, uh, um, stereocenters, but it also works very well for multiple stereocenters. Okay, so in a Fisher projection, we have to follow certain rules. The first rule is you always draw the longest carbon chain vertically, okay? Okay, so we do this because that tells us where all, this, all the substituents are, all the hydrogens and all the things that are attached, okay? So <clears throat> in this case here, we have one, two, three, four carbons. So we have to go a vertical line and Come on. So we're going to do a vertical line with our carbon one at the top. Okay. So our carbon one is this one right here because the next thing over has the bromine on it, which we want that substituent to be on the lowest carbon. So we're going to say this is a CH3. And then we're going to, the next things that are attached to it, we do it a vertical line. I mean, sorry, a horizontal line. Okay. And these horizontal lines, remember, have to be pointing out at you. So it's really can be represented by a wedge where we have the bromine on one side and a wedge where we have the hydrogen on the other. Because remember, the next carbon's down here. And then in this case here, we have a hydrogen and a hydrogen. 
And in this case here, we have one more carbon with a hydrogen and a hydrogen and a hydrogen. Okay. So let me redraw it in a perfect Fisher projection here. Horizontal lines come out at you. Vertical lines are all in a row or go behind. Okay. So that makes it easier to tell which pairs of enantiomers there are. Okay. So you need to practice on converting this structure into this structure. And if you look at the homework, and remember the homework is due uh, today and not on uh, last week, the second half of the homework, you can do a, like, I think there's at least four problems on the Fisher projections here, convert from the wedge drawings to the Fisher projections. Okay. So now that we've successfully done that, we can draw its enantiomer. I'm just not holding this pen right. It's easier to draw its enantiomer, okay? So we're going to do that actually on the next slide here. All right. So the other way to think about it is we can actually use it as an easy way to assign our R and S configuration. Okay. So in this case here, we actually have not drawn this as a correct Fisher projection. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at it, but uh, we're going to redraw it as a Fisher projection on the next slide. You want to assign the priorities. You want to, oh. You want to draw an area from priority one to priority two, okay? If the lowest priority uh, group is a vertical bond, meaning you can't go one, two, and three, this is four, so that you can't go there, then it must be clockwise, and therefore you have an R configuration. What if you had the three group over here? If you had the three group over there, then it would give you one, two, and three, then that would be um, being able to go clockwise, okay? I don't really like this description. I would prefer that you go back and assign it with R and S looking at your hand, remembering that this is an, a wedge coming out, this is a wedge coming out, and these are going back so that you have your priorities of your hand right here with your one here, your two here, and your three here. I think it's easier to assign that way. And so, uh, but this is also laid out in uh, my organic tutor. He does this configuration for multiple uh, centers as well. So if you want extra practice, go ahead and do that. But again, I like to draw it uh, you, or use my hand for assigning RNS. Okay, so now the best part of Fisher projections is it makes it very easy to draw all of your stereo centers. Okay, so let's start with this compound here. And again, it's the 3-chloro-2-butanol. So that means that we have four carbons, one alcohol, one chloro group, and we know exactly where they are. Okay. So what I want to do is I actually want to go over to my uh, blank slide, and I want to show you how to do that. Okay. Where's oh oh back uh, other blank, and here we go. Okay. So I said uh, the three. Chloro, chloro, uh, two butanol, butanol. Okay, so that means it's going to look something like this. We have right here. We're just going to draw the first isomer, and then I'm going to show you how to use the um, Fisher projection to draw all the other isomers. So we're going to have OH here. We're going to have a BR here, and oh, sorry, a chlorine here. And so we have one, two, three, four carbons. We have our alcohol on the two position and our chlorine on the three position. Okay, so that being said, let's draw a Fisher projection, okay? So we have one, two, three carbons, okay? The three carbons are gonna be our vertical axis. And so we're gonna do one like that. And so we have a CH3 at the top and a CH3 at the bottom. So that takes care of two of our carbons, okay? Now we have a carbon with a bromine on it. So we're gonna draw a horizontal line but our bromine, and then the other thing has to be a hydrogen. And we're gonna draw another vertical line and we're gonna start with the OH here and the hydrogen here, okay? So now we've drawn one isomer, okay? And we've drawn it in a correct uh, position for our Fisher projection, okay? Do we see how we convert this to that? Doesn't matter whether it's RS on this one right now, we're just gonna do this, okay? Okay, and so then, 
I'm going to go ahead and assign these. And so we have a hydrogen facing out toward us. And so if we look at it, this, the carbon going down is higher priority than the carbon going up. And the bromine is the higher carbon, the higher than that one. So it's going to be one on the index finger, two on the thumb, and three on the middle finger. So one, two, three, that's counterclockwise. So that makes this an S center, okay? We're gonna do that again on the, on the other one, okay? So we're gonna look at this carbon here. Uh, we have the uh, OH is gonna be the index finger. The middle finger is gonna be the higher priority carbon and the methyl group's pointing down. So that's the lower priority carbon. So one, two, three, we look at that one, two, three, that is clockwise. So this is the R isomer. Okay, now, why did I assign them first? Okay, I just wanted to demonstrate how to assign it using the hand method on each of those systems with using a Fisher projection. Okay, now, how do we draw its enantiomer? The same way we did it with wedges. We're gonna draw a mirror plane and we're going to just draw it out. And so we're gonna start here, bromine and a line with a hydrogen. We're gonna start OH with a line and a hydrogen. We're gonna do this in a CH3 and a CH3. Okay, see how we just drew the mirror image of it? Okay, now that mirror image is, it's an antimer, right? Because it's a non-superimposable mirror image. Okay, let's prove that. <clears throat> if it's true, that means each of those stereo centers had to invert. Each of those stereos had to invert. So let's look at that. I'm gonna use my hand again. We're gonna have hydrogen way back here on here. It's facing out at us, okay? Which means, let's see, uh, let's, um, like, okay, I'm gonna have to do it this way. Hydrogen's facing there. This is gonna be the methyl group on the top. This is gonna be the bromine. And then this is gonna be the methyl, the carbon on the bottom. So this is higher priority than that. So we have one, two, three, and we look at that one, two, three, one, two, three. That is now clockwise, which means this is now, R. Oh, you're right. It's a chloro. <laughs> Sorry. CL, CL. But chlorine is still bigger than carbon. And so uh, that would be okay. But notice we've swapped from the S with the chlorine carb, chlorine containing carbon to the R. That will always happen in your mirror image. If you know that you just drew the S, you draw its mirror image, it must be the opposite. Let's prove that with the second chiral center, okay? So we have the methyl, we have again the hydrogen here. So I'm gonna use my hand with our, uh, this is our carbon pointing up, this is our carbon pointing down, and this is the OH, our hydrogen is in the back. And so we have the OH is of the highest priority. This is the second highest priority. This is the third highest priority, one, two, three. That is counterclockwise, which makes it S. Okay. All right. So that's a good thing about our Fisher projection is that once you draw one, it's easy to draw the second one because you don't have you you can just draw the mirror image of the Fisher projection. And notice how the stereo centers have swamped. Okay. Now, how do we get to our second set of enantiomers. This is our first set of enantiomers. We have two stereo centers, so we can have up to four. So how do we convert the first Fisher projection into one of the diastereomers, okay? So the way we do that is we take one of the stereo centers and swap it, okay? So how do we do that? Well, let's go back to here. We're gonna draw our Fisher projection here. And again, we're going to keep our carbons up and down. We're going to keep our bottom group exactly the same. So that means that this is still our R configuration. We didn't move it. It's exactly the same. But what we're going to do is we're going to swap the chlorine and the hydrogen. Okay, we're only swapping two groups. All the carbons are facing away from us, right? And so we're only swapping two groups. So that means the chlorine is going to be here and the hydrogen is going to be here. Okay. When we do that, we just swapped the stereo center, and this is now the R. Okay. Now go ahead and 
check with your, however you want to do RNS, and double check with that. Again, the hydrogen's facing out at S. We're going to have one, two, three, one, two, three, clockwise R. All right. So how do we draw the next isomer? Well, again, we put our mirror plane in, and we just draw the mirror. So we're going to draw this one here. We're going to draw this one here, this one here. This is still CH3. This is still CH3. This is going to be HO. This is going to be H, and this is going to be CL, and this is going to be H. See how I went from the middle out to make sure? Okay. Now, the cool thing is, and you're going to have to go double check this yourself, but this is now S, and this is now S. Okay. So let's look at these Fisher projections. The first set is a set of, of enantiomers, and they the first one is SR, and the second one is RS. When we swap one of those um, groups here, we now have a, 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 another set of enantiomers. that are the diastereomers of the first set that are now RR and SS. So whenever you have uh, diastereomers like this, you're always going to have one that's going to be SR, one that's going to be RS, one that's going to be RR, and one's going to be SS. But see how it easy it is to look at the Fisher projection and see how to continue to can grow the all of your isomers. And if you had three stereocenters, you would then swap the next one down. And then if you had four stereocenters, you just keep going and going and going. All right, questions on Fisher projections. I think this is a great way to do anything more than one stereoisomer. Okay, back to Kim, back to five, back to. Fisher, nope, Fisher. Okay, so you can use that exact same thing and look at the, the way they're drawn here, okay? Um, apparently I drew it upside down because the, no, no, the chlorine that should have been at the top. So anyway, because the chlorine, oh, because the butanol, yeah. So this is our number two carbon. So I drew it upside down, but, but you'll notice that there's a mere plane here. And all we did was swap the, let's see, which one did we swap? We've, oh, we've swapped this carbon right here. So see how this half of the molecule is the same as this half of the molecule? And these are the same. And all we did was swap these two to get to the diastereomer. And then we drew a mirror plane and made the other one. So all of those give are the exact same ones that we drew on the last slide. All right. Uh, questions. Okay, so just to kind of help visualize this, see if we wanted to visualize this as a way of how these things actually work in space. Well, you could just imagine that um, this compound would be a puppy. And so we have our longest vertical axis would be its backbone. And so we'd do that right there. And then we've had each leg would be one of the other compounds. And so if you took that puppy, laid it on its back, and with its head at the top and its tail at the bottom, that's a Fisher projection, okay? All right, questions on that? My wife made this, by the way. She, she really went all out for the puppy thing. Okay, so now that you have a way to start with one isomer and you can switch just one carbon and get to the other set, but you got to remember that the way this looks is we have our wedges here. Now, the problem is when this is drawn this way, it's not correct. Why isn't that isomer correct? All the carbons aren't vertical axis. We have to redraw that Fisher projection to make it the right drawing. This is an incorrect Fisher drawing, okay? So that means all of our carbons have to be in the vertical axis, which means we have to swap at least one. So how do we do that? Well, we remember that our, um, we remember that our carbons have to be in the longest chain. So how do we get there? Is we rotate this 120 degrees where we put the carbon back because it has to be top. When we do that, the hydrogen flips to this side and the OH comes out. So now our OH is out and our hydrogen's out and our methyl group is back, okay? 
So this was an incorrect projection. We could not see if it was, we should not be able to draw all the isomers that way because it is in the wrong configuration. Now, this drawing is in the correct configuration. When we do redraw it with our carbons on our vertical axis and our substituents on our horizontal axis, we actually can see now this compound is a meso compound because it has a mere plane, okay? It's a lot easier than trying to redraw this kind of structure here and see if there's a mere plane, okay? So it's exactly the same uh, representation of this and this, but when we draw it as the Fisher projection, it's much easier to see the mirror plane. Okay, what time are we at? Okay, 10.50. Okay, we're gonna go five or six more minutes and then we're gonna take a break. All right. So when we're looking at these things, what we're gonna see is that constitutional isomers and diastereomers have different physical properties, okay? Boiling point, melting point, solubility, okay? Enantiomers are identical except for how it interacts with light, okay? So we have to say, well, okay, why does this happen? Well, it turns out that because light has an electronic and a magnetic uh, vector in it, and if you've taken physics, you've done the right-hand rule where one's the magnetic, one's the electronic, and I mean, the magnetic, the electronic, and the direction, uh, so that when this electronic vector is in a single plane, it interacts with one side of the molecule differently than the other side of the molecule. And when it does that, it changes direction. Okay, so what do we mean by polarized light? So polarized light is when you look at the sun, the light waves are all coming in all different directions. Okay, so we have our light wave coming in this direction here and this one coming in this direction. So what we do is we filter out all the light that isn't going in the same direction, okay? So that means all the light coming through the filter is all in the same orientation and will all interact with the chemicals in exactly the same plane, okay? In a compound that is optically inactive, not an optical isomer, nothing happens because the interaction is the same, is the same with the light on one side of the molecule versus the other side of the molecule, so nothing happens. Okay, so what we see is the planes of light are going to continue and not work. But if a compound is optically active, one side of the molecule is going to react with the light more than the other. And so as they go through the system, they're going to start to slowly move over because one side is pulling that electric field a little bit more than the other because they're different in space. And what we see is that we no longer have just the light coming through, we actually have rotated the light from where we started to where we end. And when we rotate this light, we measure that angle in degrees, okay? So this is called alpha, and this is our observed optical activity. So again, the polarized light reacting with something that has no stereoisomers is gonna tilt, you know, a little bit both ways and they'll cancel each other out. But if it's interacting with one side more than the other, they're going to continue to turn. And the amount they turn is measured. We can't predict it. We just have to measure it. Okay. So let's measure it. So an optically active compound, and this is a definition, is one that rotates polarized light. So all chiral compounds that aren't meso rotate light. Okay. Optically inactive are everything else. Okay. If you rotate the light clockwise, then you have dextrorotatory or right-handed, and it's put at either a D, a little d, or a plus, okay? If it rotates the light counterclockwise, we call that laborotatory or left rotating, and that's a little l or a minus, okay? Now, R and S have nothing to do with whether it rotates it clockwise or counterclockwise, okay? nothing to do with it. It's just you have to measure it. So that it's very important you measure it and don't say, well, it's R, it must be this. You cannot tell, you must measure it. But if it rotates it clockwise, it's dextrorotatory, lab, or, which is D or plus. If it rotates it counterclockwise, it's laborotatory or minus. Okay. So let's talk about what happens if you have a mixture. What if you have a, a pure um, compound that's R, and you have a pure compound that's S, okay? And you measure R by itself, and it has rotational light, 
Okay, let's say it rotates the light 10 degrees uh, in the plus direction. Okay, and that means that the other compound, because it's the mirror image, has to rotate the light 10 degrees in the other, uh, other direction. If you have an equal mixture of the two chiral compounds, half of it's going to rotate the light this way, half of it's going to rotate the light that way. And that means it's not going to rotate light. Even though we have true optical isomers, if you have a racemic mixture, which is equal portions of the two, it's going to cancel that out. Okay. And it's going to look like a non chiral compound. Okay. So, how can we uh, measure that we've actually, the R gives us this and the S gives us equal and opposite? Well, to do that, we have to. Uh, calculate this out in a nice way. We're not going to do the calculation. What I want you to know is that an R compound is going to rotate your light one direction, X degrees. The S compound is going to rotate in the opposite direction, that same number of degrees. Okay. But let's show you how to do the calculation. So when we just measure this here, we can measure it a bunch of different ways by how long the path is, what kind of light you used, what kind of concentration. So those all depend on how much interaction with the light you have. So we have to standardize it. So we have what we call specific rotation. Specific rotation has been normalized or recalculated to give us our normal comparison. It's one gram of the enantiomer per milliliter solution. We have 10 centimeters or one decimeter long. So it gives enough light to interact with. And then we usually do a specific wavelength because different wavelengths of light have different energy. Right? That's what we learned in IR. So we need to be pay attention to that. And temperature, because temperature is going to give a little bit of an interaction. So when we do that, we ended up with a bracket around our observed rotation, but we have our temperature and our wavelength of light, nu here, uh, accounted for. And the way we do that is we take our measured observed rotation, divide by the, the length of the cell, and the concentration of the cell. And this gives us a number. And this number is going to be the number that you will see in the literature because that number is a number that I can say, I can say, hey, I got this number and somebody across the world can do the exact same experiment in a different way, account for the length and the concentration and get the exact same number. So that's why we do specific rotation. All right. Okay. So, hmm. So I have a specific rotation. I measured my R and my R says, I'm gonna go and it's gonna rotate light plus 5.7 degrees. Okay, because I measured it, not because I predicted it, I measured it. And my S is gonna go minus 5.7 degrees because it's equal and opposite. And so the two pure compounds are gonna do one and then the other pure compound is gonna do equal and opposite. Okay. But what if you have a non-equal mixture? Okay, if you have a non equal mixture, you can actually come up with how much excess of one enantiomer you have of the other. We call that enantiomeric excess. Now, why is it the excess of one more than the other? Okay, well, so you have, if you have equal portions, one's going to do half of it's going to rotate this way, half of it's going to rotate that way, and they cancel each other out. But let's say you only have five of these and you have 10 of these only half of the signal is going to be canceled out because the other half of the signal is going to make it through because they're not being canceled out because each of the isomers are canceling, right? So we can define that as the observed rotation divided by the specific rotation times 100, telling us we have 60% in antimeric excess. Hmm. That means that there's at least 60% of the signal is not being canceled out. 60% of the signal is not being canceled out. That means 40% of the signal is being canceled out. With 40% of the cancel signals being canceled out, that means half of it's the one isomer and the half of it's the other isomer because that's how they cancel each other out. So 40% is canceling each other out. The other 60% is the isomer. Which isomer is it? Well, in the case of this, our observed rotation is positive, and therefore it must be um, more of the R component of the S component. Okay, so in this case here, we have forty percent of the signal being canceled out. Okay, so that means that we have twenty percent of one and twenty percent of the other to cancel that signal, 
which means we only have 20% S, but we have the full 60% of the R which we measured plus the 20% of the R that was canceled out. So that means that in a 60% uh, enantiomeric excess, we have 80% R and 20% S. And if you wanna do a backwards calculation, it's like 20% of S is gonna cancel out 20% of the R, leaving us 60% R, which is equivalent to the enantiomeric excess. All right, uh, questions on enantiomeric excess? So it's kind of a simple calculation and it's in the homework. So you'll get a couple practice. All right, now, I said before that enantiomers have identical physical properties, but once you have diastereomers, you can now have different properties. So let me demonstrate that here. If we look at these two enantiomers here, this is tartaric acid, I think, and it's got two carboxylic acid groups on it and an OH and an OH, and it has a non-superimposable mirror image. So A and B are enantiomers. They have the exact same melting points. They have, and, they have the exact same solubility in water. One rotates the light plus, okay? We have two stereo centers, so you know, it could be either, right? And then we have the other one rotates it exactly equal and opposite. Plus 13 for the A isomer, minus 13 for the B isomer. And if we actually went back and looked, identify your R and your S here, we would see that we have a RR, which means it's an antimer because it's the mirror image, must be the SS. And our designation for D because it rotated it positive, the other one's designated as L because we rotated it negative. Okay, now let's look at the diastereomer here. Now, the first thing we need to remember about our diastereomer here is if we draw our mirror plane here, we have a meso compound. The hydroxyls are both back, the hydrogens are both forward. Is R, no, uh, there's a question on the thing saying, is R always positive and S always negative? No, it is, you cannot predict it. You have to measure it. So dextro rotatory does not equate to R and S. In fact, we have two different uh, systems here, two different stereo centers. So we could have a whole bunch of different numbers. So it, you have to measure it. It is not uh, calculatable. All right, so when we look at our meso compound here, so we only have one diastereomer, but it has a different melting point and solubility because it's a meso compound, even though it technically has two stereocenters, near plane cancels out optical activity. And it's designated RS, and then when you flip it around, it's RS. It does not have a designation because it's not there. But if you mixed an equal portion of A and B, uh, you change the melting point, or your optical activity goes to zero. And if your optical activity goes to zero, we say it's a mixture of DNL or a racemic mixture. Okay, so that means you can separate our materials by difference in solubility. You can separate our diastereomers, sorry. You can separate diastereomers by solubility because they have different solubilities in water. Okay, so how do we know that we can do this? Well, it turns out the guy who figured this chiral chemistry out, he didn't actually figure out chiral chemistry, what he figured out was optical rotation and that things had equal and opposite interactions was Pasteur. And the way he did this was that he was looking at a tray of tartaric acid crystals. And he noticed that there were three types of crystals. One crystal looked like the mirror image of the other crystal. And then there was a third crystal. So what he did was he separated them out into piles and he found out the one crystal had optical activity positive the other crystal had optical activity equal and opposite to it. And the third crystal had no optical activity at all. Okay, so he was able to say that he had, this isomer was one type of crystal, this isomer was a second type of crystal, and this isomer was a third type of crystal, and they all had different optical activities. Okay, so that's actually how it first got done. It's, it's funny, we call it the Pasteur purification method, but that's where this all began. Now, it's easier to purify diastereomers. So if you have a one chiral center that you want to play with, you can convert it to something else that has two chiral centers, separate them, and then convert it back. And we call that diastereomic recrystallization. So you can isolate one or the other. The best way to do that, though, is enzymatic uh, enzyme resolution, because enzymes react only with one isomer, leaving the other one 
unreactive. And so that's a great way to do it. And then you can actually do some kinds of chroma chromatography that helps that. Okay, uh, questions on enantiomers, optical activity, and our um, uh, optical and, and the properties of enantiomers versus diastereomers. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to take a break here. Uh, let's come back in about five minutes and uh, go ahead and uh, don't run away. Uh, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll pause the recording and we'll come back soon. Okay. All right. I'm pausing the recording. Where is the pause button? There it is. Pause. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> this is my fur baby. Well, one of them. I have real ones too, but this is so, uh, gingerbread. Found her in the middle of the road. She's one of my best cats. She was the one meowing in the background. Meow. You want to go meow? You want to go down? Meow, meow, meow. Going to meow for the camera? No? OK. All right. Get out. Out, out, out. Out, 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 out. In case you heard the crying in the background, I wasn't torturing a cat. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, she's our best cat. Um, we have, we got the kids uh, a, a litter mate pair uh, for Christmas one year, about five or six years ago. And they're fun, but this cat is so much more fun. Okay, got about two more minutes and we'll come back on. Okay, we have 12 people. So, and I have seen people are watching the videos, so. Um, I know I talk fast, but it's good to slow me down just a little bit to take notes better. <laughs> so. All right, I'm coming back online. Let me go ahead and stop share and reshare. Um, usually when I pause, it always has a problem. So I won't do that. <clears throat> there we go. Sharing again. Uh, we're right here at 1110. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start recording again. Resume share. Oh, I 
YouTube resumed share or not. Oh, I was recording the whole time. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me make sure. I didn't pause the recording. I paused share. That's why. Okay. Uh, resume share. All right. There we go. We should have our shared screen up here with resolution of enhancing errors. Do we see that? Um, yeah, there we go. I got a thumbs up. All right. Let's continue on. We only have a couple more slides and we're going to start on chapter six. Okay. So the thing I want to talk about is stereochemistry and reactions. Okay. There's different types of stereochemistry reaction. We're going to talk a lot about this in chapter seven, but I want to introduce the topic here when you, what we're talking about. When we have a reaction that is stereoselective, meaning it only gives one isomer, okay? So some reactions will go where you have a compound is going to come in and react on the opposite side of the group that's going to leave, and it will to, it'll make one isomer and one isomer only. So if you started with one isomer here, you're only going to get one isomer. When that is what we call stereo selective. You start with one, you end up with one. That's it. Okay. Now there's also what we call a stereo specific reaction. Okay. Stereo specific reaction will yield particular stereo isomers depending on which stereo isomer you start with. So in the case of this, we'll have a cis, or I mean a trans product here, I mean a trans starting material, and it's going to yield one isomer. In this case, it's the 2R3S isomer. But if you started with the cis version instead of the trans, it's actually going to yield a pair of enantiomers. So if you had a mixture of the trans butene and the cis butene and you did this reaction, you would end up with a pair of enantiomers plus the meso compound, which is its diastereomer. So that's what we call a stereo specific reaction. It will yield specific isomers based on what you start with. Stereoselective is you get you start with one and you end with one. Okay. Now that only works if you are doing the reaction on the stereo center. Let's say you have this compound here. Here's your stereo center, but you're doing your reaction way over here. Okay. That means your stereo center did not change, assuming that you didn't change any of the prioritizations. The stereo center did not change, and therefore it does not change. Now if you change the priorities of the group, then it does change. But notice the stereo center itself is this exact same place in space, okay? So we have to think about whether or not there's a bond broken on that stereo center. And so you can actually have reactions on a non-stereo center that will change the stereochemistry because it changes priority. So look for whether it changes priority or not, and whether or not it's reacting on the actual chiral carbon or when it's not chiral, one of the unchiral or asymmetric centers. I mean, I'm sorry, symmetric centers. So then we have the other thing is absolute configuration versus relative configuration. In a three-dimensional structure, you have an RS is the absolute configuration, but we can't tell you whether it's going to rotate light in one direction or the other. Okay, so in a relative configuration, we can tell whether it's the same or different because it did change the optical rotation of light. Okay, so absolute configuration is that fixed one in space, even though we don't know which one it is. We don't, we know by name which one it is, we just don't know whether it's going to rotate light which way, but we'll have that relative configuration. Okay. So the same relative configuration as the reactant, but the opposite relative to the reactant. Okay. All right, and last crazy thing about chiral molecules is you can actually have chiral centers on any sp3 hybridized car, uh, any sp3 hybridized center. Why? Well, if you have four different groups in a tetrahedron, you are satisfying the rule for chirality on a carbon. That means any of your uh, main groups that do any kind of sp3 hybridization, and they all do because it saves energy, will form chiral compounds if you have four different things on silicon, uh, germanium, yeah. Uh, and even if you have a quaternary amine that has four different groups on it. Now, in this case here of sulfur, we have four bonds and a lone pair that takes up space. So 
four bonds to a uh, an sp3 hybridized center so that's where we're hanging and then this of course is a p orbital here on the s and a p orbital on the o that are making that last bond the other weird thing you can have is you can actually have a non steric center, but because the rigid inside is acts as a thing that locks it in space. So those two double bonds are locking this uh, groups at, in space because one pi bond has to be 90 degrees from the other pi bond to get to that structure. And that means that's also has an enantiomer because it makes non superimposable mirror images. Okay. So an asymmetric compound is a non superimposable mirror image. Uh, but in this case here, these are enantiomers uh, because they are, uh, the, that's the definition of non superimposable mirror image. All right, so there are some crazy ones out there, but uh, for the most part, we're going to be using chiral carbons. Occasionally, we'll use a chiral nitrogen. Okay. Questions on chapter five. All right, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about mechanisms. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is to go to um, Canvas, uh, share screen with uh, Canvas, and share. And if we go to Files, there is under should be under resources, five patterns of mechanisms, okay? So this right here is what you're going to uh, look at and say, okay, if I don't know what's going on, let's look at that. And then we also are going to have, this is where we're going to find our thermo activity tomorrow, okay? So let me go ahead and stop sharing that and go back to my slides and share screen. Share. All right. Screen is sharing is pause. Screen is there. Okay. So we said before that there are four kinds of reactions. There are substitution reactions where one thing is replaced. There's addition reactions where we add something. There's elimination reactions where we take something away. And then there are um, rearrangements. Okay. But all of these happen for a reason. So I want to talk about the reasons why things change in a molecule. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is that there usually is a change in energy. And so to help us understand how things change over the course of a reaction, we do something we call an energy diagram. In an energy diagram, we take the relative energy, stored energy, Gibbs free energy, enthalpy, and put that on the y-axis. And then we put the different times in the reaction going along the x-axis, okay? Now, if you want to think about it as this is the path and energy that a single molecule takes, the total reaction is something else, but a single molecule will have to go through this amount of energy to go from its starting material to its product, okay? So, and the difference in energy between the starting material and the product is what we call our change in Gibbs free energy, which is equated to our change in enthalpy, and I'll show you why. Okay. So when we look at this, we have a transition state. That's the highest point in energy, okay? The highest point in energy. So we're going to look at that as a peak. That's where things are, bonds are being made or broken, and we're forming new uh, molecules, okay? The energy it takes to get from your starting material to your transition state is what we call the energy of activation. They don't react until they have that minimum amount of energy to make that transition state. Once you've made that transition state, it can go either back to starting material or to products. But you have to have all that energy there before it can even get to that transition state. Okay, so those are kind of definitions. So when we think about our reaction coordinate, we're talking about, is it starting materials? Is it a transition state? Is it products? And so, so we're looking for those different parts of the energy system. And then when we look at the difference between the starting material and the products, we get our change in free energy. Okay, so let's look at a diagram here. All right. So I said our energy is on our, um, let's go, 
is on our y-axis, and that's increasing energy, okay? So this is either potential energy or free energy, the energy stored in the bonds or the energy that can be released from those bonds, okay? So think of it that way. And in this case here, we have our reactants. You know, so reactant A has so much energy, reactant B has so much energy, and they're going to not change until you put them together, okay? Now, now they have to wait until you add enough energy to get it to the transition state to react, okay? Imagine that you could pour two things in a, in a reaction and they don't react, but when you heat it up, it reacts. The heat is giving it that activation energy, okay? Now, in this transition state, again, it can go back down to starting materials and you just wouldn't see it. Or you can create a new bond and go to products, okay? When you go to products here, there's usually a, um, a barrier to get back to starting materials and so that we have our products here. Now, the difference between what we started with in our energy and what we ended with in our energy is the change in free energy of the reaction. Okay. Now, if the change in free energy of the reaction is positive, meaning we're giving off energy, that means it's exogonic, okay? Exo meaning gives off, higher gonic. So we're giving off free energy. Now, the way to think about that is that if you had stored energy in bonds, most of the time when they go from that higher energy state to the lower energy state, they give off heat. So we also call those reactions that go from a higher energy to a lower energy exothermic. They gave off heat to get there, okay? Now, the other way is if instead of being this positive change right here, uh, um, you know, having a, a, a going to less energy, so it's technically a negative change, you go to an energy above the starting materials or you've changed it, you had to put energy into those bonds. And we call that endergonic, meaning that you it has now has more energy than it had before, or endothermic, meaning it had to absorb the heat to get into that energy, okay? And I'll talk about these little terms here, there. So most of the time we can say that a uh, reaction that has products that are lower in energy are exothermic, and any product that is higher in energy is endothermic, okay? We most of the time use, in fact, I will almost always use endothermic and exothermic. Okay, so how do we know whether something's endothermic or exothermic? Well, in this case here, we look at our reaction diagram. Okay, so in this case, we have energy, we have starting materials going to transition state, going to products. Okay, so those are our reaction coordinates. Okay, so we have our reactants, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. Oh, let's give it some energy. So we're giving it enough energy, our activation energy. And when it does that, we can start breaking bonds and making bonds, okay? If we're breaking bonds and making bonds, we've hit that transition state. And again, if we go to products, we're gonna come down here and we're gonna measure those, those bonds made are storing energy. Now, are the bonds made higher in energy have more stored energy than our reactants. And in this case, it is because our energy of those bonds is above the reactants, meaning this is an endothermic reaction, absorbed heat. And where does that heat come from? The activation energy here. Now, it's also endergonic because we, again, had to use some of this energy from the transition state to store in those bonds, and therefore it's endergonic or endothermic and absorbed energy because the products are higher in energy, okay? Now, in the case of this over here, we have the opposite thing happening. We have our reactant starting at one energy. Uh, no pen. We have our reactant starting at this energy. We used some energy to get to that transition state, but then we released a bunch of energy after it to get to our final products. Those bonds have less energy in them than they had before. Therefore, they're giving off that energy usually as heat or free energy. So this is an endo exothermic reaction or exergonic reaction. And this is an endothermic because it, the energy at the product is higher than the starting material. Okay, questions on that. So you need to know uh, endothermic, exothermic, and the, their equivalents in uh, endergonic and exogonic. And you need to know the different parts of our 
reaction diagram. Okay, so let's talk about the transition state. The transition state is basically the energy needed to break those bonds. Okay, so if you don't have enough energy to start making and breaking bonds, the reaction is either going to happen very slowly or not at all. Okay, so that's why some reactions you have to heat up really high and some reactions you don't because the change in that activation energy is either small, meaning you don't have to heat it very much, or very big and you have to. So the larger the uh, uh, activation energy or E sub A, the more energy you'll have to put into the system, heat more. And that makes the reaction slower because you have to wait around for your materials to get enough energy to actually be in the right place and do the reaction, okay? So let's talk about how we draw this transition state, okay? That transition state means that we're actually forming and or breaking a bond at the same time, okay, in a lot of these reactions. And in, in the reaction, this first reaction we're going to show, we're going to show a bond forming and breaking at the same time, okay? And that's our transition state. And we have that little double dagger there. That means that that's our transition state. Notice it's in brackets. Transition states are basically don't last very long and almost hypothetical, meaning that you broke a bond and made a bond at the same time, but you didn't have five bonds to whatever the middle is at all. So you're looking at it as a just a, a, a passing uh, transition or a, you know it's not an actual I isolatable thing. So in this case here, we already have a bond between A and B, okay? And we have C with these electrons trying to come in and make a new bond. Okay, so that means we can't have this um, C just add to B and have five bonds because you can't have five bonds to carbon, you can't break crack that rule. So what happens is C will start to make a bond with B, but to make that happen, the bond between A and B has to start breaking. This is our transition state. This is that split second when bonds are being made and broken at the same time. And when we do that, the A takes the electrons away with it because those was the electrons that were in the AB bond and the BC is our new bond made, okay? So that's one way to do it is where you're making and breaking bonds at the same time. And that's noted by our transition state here. But is that the only way that it can happen? No. In fact, we can do it where we're, uh, we can do uh, more than one thing happening at one time. Okay, so for example, in the case of our reaction here, our transition state is where our double bond is going to end up, uh, let's see, yeah. So we're gonna be breaking a double bond by making a new bond with hydrogen. So these electrons are gonna come and make a new bond with hydrogen. These bonds are gonna break right here and we're gonna be left with a positive charge here. So what did we do? We broke a bond, we broke the pi bond to make a charged intermediate. So in the case of this transition, we're breaking a bond, we're making a bond, but we are also making a high energy compound. High energy compounds are compounds that are not very stable, but you can actually isolate them and play with them. They, they actually exist for a period of time. The transition state is immediate. The intermediate is something you can see by spectroscopy or something else, okay? You typically don't isolate it, but you can. So the transition state is temporary, fleeting, milliseconds. Intermediates can last for a longer period of time. Now, once you have a high energy intermediate, then you need to react it to get it to a regular molecule. So what did we really do here? Well, we made a bond and broke a bond, and then we're gonna make a bond in this one right here, because we are gonna use these electrons to form it. So we broke a bond, we made a bond, we broke a bond in this transition state. And here we just have to make a bond. We don't have to break a bond. Okay, so the transition state is fleeting. The intermediate can be isolated. All right, so that means that this reaction had two steps because we made an intermediate. So what does the energy diagram look like now? Okay, so the energy diagram had to change because in the first energy diagram we saw, we were making and breaking a bond at the same time and it went to products. That didn't happen. So we have to draw a different energy diagram, okay? So in our energy diagram here, we're gonna look at that same set of things that are happening. We're gonna look at our energy change. We're gonna look at our coordinates and what's happening as we go. So we have starting material, we have 
transition state, transition state, starting material, intermediate, transition state, and then finally products, okay? So we have different zones in there, okay? Now let's look at each zone. So we have starting material here. We add enough energy to get to our first transition state. We're breaking and making and breaking a lot. That's gonna form this higher energy limit. How do we know that intermediate's higher in energy? Well, it's higher in energy than the starting materials right here. So if it's that high energy, that means it's going to react because it will react with, you know, it's, and, and not only is that such a high energy, notice this little, this little peak here. That's still the activation energy to react the intermediate with whatever thing you're reacting with. And notice it's very small, okay? Now, once it gets to this transition state, it forms a, a, a permanent bond and you get to products. And our products here are lower energy in our starting material. So it's an exothermic reaction, but it happens in two steps. Any reaction that happens in two or more steps must have an intermediate and must have more than one transition state. One step reaction, you have starting material, transition state, products. Two step or more reactions, you have starting material, transition state, intermediate, transition state, maybe another intermediate, another transition state. It can go on until you finally get to products. All right, let's see, we got nine minutes left. All right, questions on one-step reactions versus two-step reactions. Okay, so let's put that to the test, all right. So we're gonna actually do our activity, our thermodynamics activity tomorrow. We're gonna look at those endothermic, exothermic, kinetics, et cetera. So how can we see how fast a reaction is going looking at our reaction coordinate diagram, okay? Hmm, so we said before that the higher the activation energy, the slower the reaction. The higher the activation energy, the slower the reaction. Why? Oh, in this case here, we have a one-step reaction, meaning we only have a transition state here, okay? So in that transition state, reactant A and reactant B have to be in the exact same place at the exact same time with the right amount of energy to have one bond make and one bond break. So that a lot of things just had to happen there. Two things had to come together. They had to have the right energy. They had to have the right position. And all of those things had to happen, okay? Now, let's say you have a different reaction and it's harder to get all that energy to get in all those positions. So it took more energy, so you have fewer molecules that have enough energy, and you have that happening at this, you know, so we have, let's say we have 10 molecules in, you know, the lower one, five of them will react at, you know, in, you know, I'm sorry, let's say we have 10 molecules in the first one, and one of them reacts, and well, now a whole bunch of the energy is released, and they can react more and more and more. In the case of the higher energy one, fewer molecules are reacting because fewer molecules have all the energy they need. Now, how can we change that? Well, we can change that by increasing the temperature. So we have more energy. So more molecules have a higher activation energy, or we can increase the concentration. More molecules are coming in interaction with each other. So by raising temperature or concentration, we can increase the rate. But reactions with Lower activation energies are always faster than reactions with higher activation energies. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that we have to define how, how fast a reaction is. And we do that with what we call rate laws, okay? So rate laws are different for different types of reactions. So we need to measure our rate law to figure out what kind of reaction we have and how fast the reaction is gonna go, okay? So the rate is just the amount of product formed over a unit time. Imagine it's how much time it takes to get, you know, 90% of it to get to your products right here. And the rate constant is proportional to the concentration of the reactants and uh, the energy barrier of the transition state, okay? The larger the rate constant, the faster the reaction, okay? So that means that if we have a low energy barrier, it goes faster, we have a higher rate constant. 
If we have a high energy barrier, it goes slower because it has fewer things at that, uh, at that temperature and therefore our rate constant goes down. Okay, so if we look at our rate law or our equation, it's directly related to the, how fast the reaction goes is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of the reactants. Remember I said in the one, we can uh, increase the number of incidents where they hit together by increasing the concentration. Okay, so let's think about this. The rate constant and the energy of activation are inversely proportional. Lower the activation energy, the higher the rate constant. And the opposite is true, okay. Single step reactions, the rate con concentration must contain both reactants or all the reactants because they both participate in the um, transition state. In multi-step reactions, the concentration only comes into play with the first step or the rate determining step. In the case of that, the rate determining step, usually the first step, it's the slowest step in a multi-step reaction. So rate determining step is the slowest step. And how do we know that? It's probably gonna be the one with the highest activation energy. So the greatest change in activation energy is going to be your slowest step. Because remember, that's the one where you have to have everything in there. So to make sure we're writing this correctly, let's go ahead and do a order of rate equation. And so we'll be able to see our order of the rate by whether or not both or all of the different components are important or only some of the components are important. <clears throat> so if we do that, we have a reaction where we have A and B are gonna react with C to form a new thing and B and C. So that means this is a reactant here, this is a reactant here, it's a one-step reactant, they both have to be there at the same time, okay? So that means both components must be in our rate law. So our rate is equal to the whatever constant we just measured times the concentration of A, B plus the concentration of that. And if we look at this as an exponent of one, exponent of one and an exponent of one, you add those exponents together, you get two. So this is a second order rate law, okay? So depending on how many different uh, reactants are necessary for your transition state means that's what has to happen to give you your thing. So if you have two components required for your transition state, it's a second order rate equation. Okay, so what if you have a multi-step reaction? Okay, in a multi-step reaction, the one with the highest energy has to go first because everything else has a lower energy barrier and goes faster. So when we think about that, we only care about the slow step. The slow step is our rate determining step and the entire reaction is waiting for the slow step, okay? So that's the rate determining step or the uh, slow step. And so that means our rate law only is worried about that rate determining step. All right, so how do the react rate, rate equations change for two-step reactions? Well, in a two-step reaction, we have to break a bond first, then form an intermediate. Then that intermediate has to react with step two to form our product, okay? So that means only the concentration of AB is important because you have to break that bond first, okay? So only the concentration of AB is important, which means that's the only one we put in our rate law. Our rate is equal to our measured, our measured, our rate is equal to our measured constant times the concentration. Okay, so in this reaction here, by changing the concentration of either component, you're gonna change the rate. In this reaction here, all the only thing that's gonna change the rate is the concentration of AB. Okay, now there's only a one here on the thing, so we call that a first order rate. So if we put our exponent there as one, we have a first order rate equation. Only one component is important. Okay, so how do you determine reaction rates? Well, you measure them. You can't predict them, you just measure them. And enough of them have been measured that we can see what's happening. Okay, so in this case here, we're gonna take this hydroxide, react it with this compound, and it's going to be a one-step reaction, okay? So if it's a one-step reaction, it means our transition state requires this be there in the, and this be there 
and they're both there at the right energy. Okay, so that means our rate law is equal to what have we measured times this with our one exponent and our two exponent. Okay, so it's a second order rate law. <clears throat> but what happens when we change concentrations? Well, if we change concentrations, let's start with experiment one. We have this concentration of hydroxide and this concentration of the uh, methyl chloride, okay? And we measured it, it took uh, 4.7 times 10 to the minus seven moles uh, per liter per second, okay? So that's how many moles it absorbed per second. So that's not a very fast reaction if you think about moles being a, you know, the Avogadro's number. <clears throat> so let's change the experiment and just double the concentration of, let me change colors here, double the concentration of this, but keep this the same. So notice these are the same and these are now different. So I've doubled one of the things. What happens to the rate, okay? Well, there's already excess of this right here, but once we double the rate, I'm sorry, once we double the concentration of the methyl chloride, we actually double the rate too. This is about five, this is about 10, okay? All right, so it's very important. The concentration of methyl chloride is very important. What about the concentration of hydroxide? Well, let's go back to our original number for that and double our amount of hydroxide, okay? So we have the original amount plus doubling the amount, and guess what happens? We double the rate, we double the rate. It's about 10, okay? So that means methyl chloride is important for the reaction. Hydroxide is important for the reaction, okay? Well, let's double check, okay? Let's go ahead and double both of them. We're gonna double this one and double this one. What happens to the rate? Well, if doubling one doubles the rate and doubling the other doubles the rate, guess what happens? You actually get four times. This is about 20. So this is one, this is times two, times two, and this is times four. So doubling one component doubles your rate. Doubling both components doubles your rate in second order equations, okay? In first order equations, you do not see that. All right, <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, talk about this tomorrow. Equilibrium, I'm sorry, I ran over by two minutes. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. Uh, stop recording.